Uh, hi, good evening or good morning, and thanks uh, everyone for joining TinyML Talks today. This is the last uh, meetup uh, for the year of 2021, and this is the first inaugural uh, meetup uh, hosted by TinyML com community in Ukraine. Uh, I'm Oleg Boguslavsky, and I'll be the moderator of the today's session. And uh, the topic of the today's session is practical TinyML for industrial safety and personal performance monitoring. Uh, uh, the presenter will be Oleg Pozanov, uh, CEO of uh, Liantegra. Uh, but uh, first of all, uh, let me tell a few words about uh, our partners and strategic partners of the TinyML community, which is growing literally every day. So our strategic partners are Aeon Devices, ARM, Deployed, Edge Impulse, MSA Visual Sense, GreenWave Technologies, Gruit Incorporated, HOTG, ImageMob, Latent AI, Maxim Integrated, now a part of analog devices, a company called Quixo, uh, Qualcomm, Reality AI, Renesas, Rixon, SAP, uh, Seed Studio, SenseML, Stream Analyze, Life Augmented, ST, Synsense, and Sintiant, and uh, we always have uh, additional sponsorships available. So you can write to olga at tinyml.org for the additional information. As you can see, the list of strategic partners is expanding literally every month and every meetup. Uh, we'll have a huge 2022 TinyML Summit uh, hold on March 28th to 30th and Hyatt Regency San Francisco Airport. So uh, the meetup will be held in person. So we really have hope that uh, all these COVID issues, they won't prevent us from making uh, all these dreams uh, happen. Uh, the registration uh, was open till December 15th and uh, the deadline for postal submission uh, was, is already passed. So it was due to December 17th, but you still try uh, contact uh, for the sponsorships options, or maybe if you have something really extraordinary. Uh, there are a couple of nominations, the best product of the year and the best innovation of the year. And uh, you can apply for these uh, awards uh, between November 15th and February 28th. Uh, the first day of the, of the summit will be the EML Research Symposium. And uh, the call for papers was also due to December 17th. So I think everything is already set. And uh, we really hope that it will be a great event and we hope that we'll be able to see everyone in person. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the last Tiny ML Talks uh, for this year. So I would like to say very happy holidays to everyone. And the next event will be right after the New Year Eve on January 4th. Uh, the presenter will be Cedric Nutteren uh, from Plumber AI, and he will be demoing the world's fastest inference engine for ARM Cortex-M. Uh, it will also start at 8 a.m. Pacific time, and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, many of you would like to be to present uh, uh, on TinyML Talks, so you can contact uh, talks at tinyml.org if you're interested in, uh, in presenting. Let me tell you a few words about uh, Ukrainian org, uh, org committee. I'm, I'm uh, very uh, um, thankful to my colleague, Sergei Kashenko, who is CEO at Yellow. This is a very big, uh, uh, fast-growing uh, crypto community, yellow.com, uh, who helped uh, to, to establish the community in Ukraine and actually to prepare the, the meetup today. And uh, uh, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm Oleg Boguslavsky. I'll moderate today's session. I'm a co-owner of, of Data Science UA. Our company provides the variety of services around uh, data science, AI, and ML. So we do consulting. We are building uh, offshore teams uh, uh, for clients from EU, US, UK. Uh, we can uh, uh, build literally the team of any size for uh, for you who will do the software development hardware development whatever you may need and uh, essentially our company builds uh, the ecosystem uh, and with our local community of uh, machine learning engineers which is more than 10,000 10, people in ukraine we are really happy to be partnering with the tiny ml uh, 
And uh, we, thanks a lot uh, once again for joining uh, today's uh, today's meetup. And uh, now I'm very happy to present uh, our speaker today. Uh, uh, coincidentally, he is also Oleg. So our speaker today is Oleg Puzanov. He's CEO and uh, co-founder and Liantegra. He is working around 20 years in commercial IT projects and uh, companies. Uh, he is my colleague in the sense that uh, we, we both worked in the embedded area for many, many, many years. Uh, he has a great sports history in terms of Ironman and uh, ultra marathons and all the other things. And uh, the products uh, which are produced by Leon Trigger are really exciting and I'm very happy that one one installation of the Integra product is actually uh, in our office right now. We uh, one of our clients is also testing this this solution right now, and it's 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 very competitive. That, that's what I can tell for sure. So I'm very happy to pass the word to, to Oleg, and uh, let's start our talk today. And hope uh, you'll be proactive and ask more and more questions. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay, uh, so thank you, Oleg. Uh, thanks for the intro. Uh, I'm glad to be uh, here today, and uh, thanks to all uh, for joining today's session. Uh, so our topic for today uh, is about uh, practical examples of uh, using uh, TinyML uh, for industrial projects. And our story, uh, the story of our company um, about why and how uh, we integrated TinyML into our products. <clears throat> Uh, so at first, a uh, couple of words about our company, uh, Lintegra, uh, who we are and what we do. So uh, our main focus is about uh, developing uh, software and hardware for RTLS. Um, RTLS stands for real-time location systems. It is about uh, tracking location indoors, inside buildings, where regular GPS doesn't work. Uh, for that purpose, uh, we are using different wireless technologies uh, based on uh, BLE, ultra wideband, Wi Fi, LTE, and so on. Uh, we have uh, specific algorithms for the purpose of location tracking based on all these wireless technologies. And uh, typically, uh, we install our equipment and deploy our solutions in different industrial locations, such as underground mines, uh, factories, warehouses, and so on. So to jump straight to uh, a case study, so you'll have a bit better understanding what kind of projects we have. So this is a, our project for one of the largest customers here in Ukraine. Uh, the company's name is DTEC. It's one of the largest company in the energy sector. They have different underground mines like coal mines. And our project, which was successfully deployed and launched was about uh, 2000, more than 2000 BLE beacons and the uh, 1700 smart lamp devices, which are just advanced uh, cap lamps for miners. So all those devices were successfully installed and launched underground uh, inside the coal mine for the purpose of uh, employee safety for underground miners and uh, location tracking. So uh, we are tracking location with an accuracy of 10 meters, uh, doing telemetry for methane. Uh, and, and other use cases. So we, we used here our proprietary algorithm based on reverse BLE RTLS. And the main advantage here is that for RTLS installation, we did not require any cables. It was a very quick process. We just installed some BLE beacons and that's it. We had the ready RTLS solution inside the mine. Uh, some other names of our customers and partners. Uh, typically, we work through system integrators in different regions who help us uh, to install and to maintain uh, systems locally for the end customers. So speaking about uh, Lintegra hardware and software, here you can see some examples of devices which we design and develop. We have an in-house engineering team for hardware and software. So some examples here like um, ATEX BLE beacons, which are suitable for installations in highly explosive mines like coal mines, IP67 industrial grade BLE beacons, uh, RTLS anchors for ultra wideband and BLE, and some more specific and specialized uh, uh, devices such as uh, embeddable uh, locators for cap lamps based on LT and Wi Fi. And I want to uh, discuss uh, these two devices uh, in some more details because uh, the demonstration of using TinyML for our platform will be based on these two specific devices. Uh, 
So these devices are PCBs with uh, Wi-Fi or LTE and also BLE on board, which are embedded inside the casing or inside the enclosure of, of, of the cap lamp. So uh, this specific device, um, which I'm showing now on this slide, was deployed for one underground mine in Bulgaria. Uh, there was a private LT network, um, with, um, which we deployed together with our partners. And this device connected to the private LT network for data transfers. Plus, there were some BLE beacons, which were installed inside the mine. And this device, it was collecting BLE signals uh, for the purpose of location tracking. Uh, another similar device was based on Wi-Fi and BLE. Uh, the idea here is, is the same. Uh, some beacons are installed inside the mine. Uh, the device, which we call locator, uh, collects BLE signals, then applies some algorithms of location tracking and delivers location data using industrial Wi-Fi. By the way, uh, for the DTEC project, we also had the deepest uh, industrial Wi-Fi installation on the ground, which was more than 500 meters at the time. Uh, in addition to hardware, we also have software, just some screenshots for you to have basic understanding what kind of features and products we have. So this is our web portal. Uh, you can see that it has uh, mapping features to show location of assets and people on the map. Then you can search for people or assets using search box by uh, the name or by personnel ID. Uh, database of, of employees, uh, historical information like historical track, which shows a trajectory, how a person walked, let's say, during the last uh, several hours. And here you can see uh, on, this, on this screenshot, uh, the so-called multi-layered map. You can enable or disable different features on the same map. For example, you can view locations of all beacons on the map, of all people on the map, or even uh, methane telemetry on the same map. So pretty advanced end-to-end -end platform with all components in place, which you need typically for RTLS system to, to run. Uh, just to uh, summarize just a couple more slides about our company, and then I'll continue to the tiny ML topics. We also have uh, some R&D activities to design our own algorithms, both for RTLS and ML, like uh, this RTLS algorithm, which we called uh, wireless ultra wideband DOA which is a completely wireless and asynchronous DOA algorithm, which doesn't need uh, precise clock synchronizations among RTLS anchors. So if you are familiar with the topic of TDOA RTLS, maybe you heard that normally uh, TDOA anchors, they require very precise uh, clock synchronizations, like down to one nanosecond. With this new algorithm, there is no need to synchronize uh, all the RTLS anchors. It means simpler installations, less expensive network equipment, and overall less risks uh, on the projects. Another example of our proprietary algorithm is the reverse BLE RTLS, which I described um, uh, about the project for DTEC. So it's a very simple, uh, from high level perspective, uh, algorithm, which is just a one dimensional uh, RTLS algorithm, which shows where you are positioned along the tunnel. Right, but this algorithm and this system based on B reverse BLE RTLS, it has a very strong advantage that its installation doesn't need any cables. So less expensive, easier installation, you know, less risks for everybody. Now, I think this is it about our company and products. Uh, if anybody has any questions about Integra overall, our products RTLS, then I would be glad uh, to answer. Uh, so far, I don't see any questions in the Q and A and uh, in the chat. So now I think we'll 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 switch to the to the to the ML part. I'm pretty sure that we'll have a little bit more questions. Okay, perfect. So let's start. Let's start with some basic theory about IMU. So IMU stands for inertial measurement unit, or some people just call it accelerometer. But normally. It includes some other components like a gyroscope, magnetometer, or barometer. Let's use IMU just as a common name. But what are the typical components or devices which enable motion tracking, right? 
Uh, the first one is accelerometer. I think many of us familiar or heard, right, about such kind of devices. It allows measuring uh, linear acceleration. Uh, there are different uh, small details which should be considered, like you should subtract the gravity component from accelerometer to measure uh, acceleration more precisely. And there is also uh, a detail which is called zero G offset because some accelerometers, they might have different deviations from the perfect measurements. Uh, then gyroscope, it measures angular velocity, right? The orientation of the rotation of the device. Uh, magnetometer uh, based on the earth magnetic field, it can measure uh, the strength of magnetic field and orientation, right? Like a compass pointing north, south, west, or east. And the fourth kind of uh, device is barometer. It measures the pressure, right? And enables measuring altitude or height of the device. Uh, plus maybe also saw different configurations for AMUs like three axis, six axis, nine axis, or the so-called uh, 3D RF, 6D RF, and so on, uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, those abbreviations simply mean that, for example, 6D RF includes both accelerometer and gyroscope. Uh, nine uh, degrees of freedom IMU includes accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer. For the case of our devices, we use uh, 3D RF, 6D RF, and 7D RF. And now some, some additional details. So this is what we use in our devices. We have both simpler and cheaper models for IMUs, like um, the one from ST Microelectronics, and more advanced and feature-rich IMUs from Bosch, both IMUs and uh, barometers. So our previous uh, older uh, devices used the three-axis accelerometer without any gyroscopes. But all the newer models, they're using both uh, IMU with uh, gyroscope and accelerometer as well as barometer. So uh, IMUs are not just for uh, motion recognition, right? We have some other use cases and usage scenarios for IMUs like uh, IMUs really help to uh, save battery for our TLS tags and BLE beacons. We have a feature on, for example, on our ultra wideband tags, which we call uh, adaptive transmission. So it's about changing the transmission rate of our TLS devices based on the presence or absence of the motion. Uh, it means that when there is no motion, there is no need, right, to send a lot of our TLS data because we understand that nothing moves, right? In this way, we send less frames wirelessly and we save battery. Just to compare, with adaptive transmission, we are able to save, I think, up to five times of battery life just by using IMU, right, together with our TLS. Then we are also using IMUs and accelerometer for common filtering uh, in our RTLS algorithms to enable smoother experience and smoother data for trajectories. Because sometimes the dot on the map, it might jump, right? And in the end, that's the main topic for today. We use IMU data for motion recognition using on-device ML based on TensorFlow Lite and Edge Impulse software. Uh, but why, you know, why is a good question? Why do we need on-device ML? Why we cannot just send raw data to the cloud or to another edge server for local processing? Why do we need to handle the execution of ML uh, functions directly on, you know, tiny MCUs like Cortex-M0, which we have, or um, NRA-52? So some, uh, some advantages and some reasons on this slide. So uh, the first advantage is that we enable uh, major power savings uh, thanks to on-device ML. Very good example is about ultra-wideband RTLS that uh, by integrating uh, tiny ML into our ultra-wideband RTLS tags, we saved up to five to 10, 10 times of battery life. Once again, up to five to 10 times, that's a lot. Uh, that was done by sending smaller ultra-wideband frames and sending less uh, ultra wideband frames. It means smaller transmission rate. Because if you keep streaming raw ultra wideband data 
like all raw data from accelerometer through ultra wideband, basically your battery can die in one week or even faster because ultra wideband radio or RF part is very power hungry. I think as I remember our devices at the peak at the peak transmission rate for ultra wideband, they consume up to 70 milliampers. That's a lot. But once again, by using uh, IMU data, we are and on device ML, we are able to send only the recognized uh, events like motion types without streaming all the raw data. That's the first advantage. Uh, the second advantage is about um, latency. As we all understand, all those handshakes between devices and servers through protocols like MQTT or HTTP, they consume time. And if you will have a really tough real-time system with tough constraints for the latency, you know, those uh, client server systems might not be the optimal option. So everything should be processed locally on the devices. So for the case of our systems, we are aiming, that is, that is still not implemented, but it's in progress. We're aiming to enable sub 10 milliseconds uh, scenarios for feedbacks, like haptic, haptic feedback using Vibra modules for ultra wideband tags or um, emergency braking for collision avoidance. This is about understanding that there is a person in front of a vehicle, for example, right? Let's say inside the factory or inside the mine and that you should apply emergency braking, automatic braking to the vehicle very quickly. You don't have any luxury, right? To ask the server to process your data and then request the reply because it might take how much time? Uh, 100 millisecond for the case of local network, maybe even one second for the case of cloud, cloud server. But here, if we do on device ML and do detection locally, then we can achieve uh, sub 10 milliseconds easily. And the third advantage, uh, it is about offline mode. It is about keeping devices operational even without when there is no network coverage, like no Wi-Fi, no LTE, but still you need to enable uh, operations of your devices, right? Like it's important for life critical systems. Plus sometimes you don't have coverage everywhere. Like our project for underground mine, it doesn't have 100% Wi-Fi coverage. I think it's like 80% of the mine is covered with Wi-Fi. Still, it doesn't mean that devices should not function where there is no Wi-Fi. For this purpose, we're using offline mode where we collect our TLS data. We do the so-called buffering, right? Plus all the on-device ML functions also work even without any kind of networks because all the algorithms are based on tiny ML and they are being processed locally without any servers. Um, so we had a very special story about deploying and uh, integrating uh, TinyML into our hardware. Uh, we started uh, the first experiment, let's call it like this, about uh, motion recognition on device, on device ML uh, around two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago. At that time, I think there was no tiny ML, maybe didn't hear about tiny ML. So we decided to implement our own custom code for motion recognition on our beacons, BLE beacons. Here on the photo, you can see uh, the device, which is called YB 2.0. It's a BLE beacon based on uh, the Nordic NRF chipset. Uh, BLE 5.0, it also has an accelerometer on board, uh, no gyroscope. That's why we had some limitations uh, for the algorithms here, but still uh, the initial uh, implementation worked fine. We didn't use vectors or any kind of orientation matrices here. It was a pure scalar uh, approach. We just took uh, the square root of all uh, accel acceleration values, subtracted the uh, gravity value, and that's, and that's it, it worked fine. No uh, standard algorithms here, no standard tools like TensorFlow Lite. It was a very simple, very small piece of code. I think it utilized k-means clustering, maybe the only part from standard formulas. Everything else was very custom, but still it worked uh, completely on device without any kinds of servers. And here you can see a demo about how it works. So this is our office. Um, in the left corner, you can see uh, some logs from the device, which does classification of the motion here.
So now we have a walk, walk kind of motion, which was recognized. And she carries beacon in her hands. Now we have fast walk, almost running, then regular walking. That's true. Okay, now we have running, 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 one false detection because the system thought that it was a fault detection, but it was not. Then idle again, and now we have running. So I should say the first version was 90% uh, accurate, which is not bad, bad you know, for the very first implementation without any kind of frameworks. Um, one second. Yeah, uh, Oleg, meanwhile, uh, we have a couple of questions coming yes. from our participants. Uh, the first question is uh, uh, the technical one from Alex Zubin. Uh, is it possible to use magnetometers underground in tunnels? Uh, yes, it's possible. Uh, you're right. We had a similar question whether, you know, there'll be any kind of, you know, interferences underground, especially in, in uh, iron ore mines, because for coal mines, by default, it seems to be fine, but you know, iron ore mines, they have a lot of magnetic interferences. So we expected magnetometer to be useless inside the mine. But according to our brief tests, it can be used, though we don't have any plans to use it. So right now, what we have is enough. I mean, accelerometer, gyroscope, and uh, barometer. Okay, uh, the next technical question is, uh... Uh, what is the battery life of the of the BLE beacon? So I know the answer that it really depends on the mode precision and other things, but I let you to answer this question as well. So what's what's the approximate battery life for the BLE beacons? Uh, uh, this is a very good question, and I should say it varies. Um, our um, industrial and ATEX uh, compliant beacons they have the battery life at least of two years, twenty four months. Uh, this beacon, uh, by default, it has uh, the battery life of 12 months, but by varying the, the parameters, right, you can decrease the, bl the blink rate, it means the transmission rate, and save some battery. So to answer your question, the battery life varies from one year to two years. There are some other beacons on the market which claim five years or seven years. I don't believe that it is practically achievable uh, to get seven years of battery life on the same battery because you know the battery itself it would simply die within seven years right but i think three years maybe to four yeah, years okay maximum. thank you yeah thank you very much uh yeah yeah thanks so uh one more question uh did you try uh laura instead of uh, wi-fi or lt in tunnels laura uh, uh, Laura, yes, I'm aware of the protocol and we had such thoughts. So uh, why, why we decided to use Wi-Fi? Because the customer uh, requested also voice and video uh, calls uh, based on the same network, right? Not just telemetry from sensors, but also voice and video. And as you understand, Laura and its throughput is not suitable for voice and video. That was the only reason. Yeah, true. Maybe for some extreme uh, low rate speech codex it might be, but definitely not for the for the something serious. Exactly. Uh, and there are two more questions actually. So the next question was also from Alexander. Uh, where uh, where Kalman filter is uh, implemented? Is it running on each variable node or on each beacon or in central system manager nodes? I I think that this question was already addressed, but just to double check. So Kalman filter uh, relates to our RTLS algorithm, not to uh, motion recognition, because for motion recognition, we are using, uh, we are using a TensorFlow light without any kind of Kalman filters. But for RTLS, we have an edge server, a locally installed server using C++ and JavaScript code, right? It gets raw data from RTLS anchors, right? And applies Kalman filtering for data processing. So to summarize, the current version of our system has common filter on the edge server, not on the MCU devices. Okay, thanks very much, Oleg. And the next question is kind of similar, but for probably with a different answer. So uh, 
the question was, does any of your devices deploy tiny ML algorithms directly on the IMU sensor for ML inference and energy savings like the STMs, uh, IMs? Um, yes. Yes, true. And my next slides will describe the whole setup, right? And our process of deploying a tiny ML to our devices. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, again, a couple of uh, technical questions from Mr. Cross. Uh, how do you charge or replace batteries on the devices? Oh, there are like, oh, there are like four, four more questions after that. So maybe maybe let's address uh, this question and after that uh, we'll let you continue and after that we'll come back with the questions with the okay, main so the questions question, how do we recharge batteries right on our yeah. devices? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so we have several models for devices uh, one of our models has a wireless charging based on chi standard you know you just put a device on a wireless charger like for an iphone and that's it some other devices have a magnetic connector like if you uh, been using, let's say, sport watches, GPS watches, you know, they have similar type of connectors. And for BLE beacons, especially uh, the ones which are shown before, the battery is just replaceable. It's not rechargeable. You just buy a battery, let's say CR2477, right? You use it for one year, two years, and then you just throw it away. Yeah, that makes sense. Again, considering the characteristics of the battery, sometimes it's 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 even more beneficial. Yeah, the battery it's not all like fifty cents, you know, not very expensive. Right, right. Okay, thanks a lot. I'll like uh, just go ahead with your presentation, and after that, I'll, uh, I'll ask you the the remaining questions. Uh, thank you. Now, I think uh, the most interesting part starts because yes, I tried to represent the whole story, why and how we reached the point that we need to start integrating some standard frameworks and standard tools for on-device ML, you know, from the tiny ML ecosystem. So um, last year we decided to redevelop um, our on-device ML based on the standard platforms like TensorFlow. So as a result, what we took, uh, we took TensorFlow Lite Micro we also decided to take Edge Impulse uh, Software as a Service, which is a great portal and platform for uh, training, uh, building, and deploying um, ML models for your uh, tiny, tiny devices, like uh, MCU-based devices. So we uh, took TensorFlow Lite, we uh, took what Edge Impulse has, we customized the bit as uh, some code, for the, for the specifics of our hardware. And now we have um, our own framework, which we call TagML, just a slightly customized uh, TensorFlow, you know, suitable for ultra wideband and BLE devices of Integra. So yes, it works now. Uh, it enables cool time critical detection scenarios. Uh, but the main point here is that we enabled uh, standard and universal tools, right? Without any kind of custom coding. So now even our customers or partners can train new ML models by themselves without any need, you know, to write any code. Now it's very easy to do and I'll show you how it is done. So this is how the end-to-end -end, uh, deployment process looks like. It might look complicated, you know, with all those steps and boxes and arrows, but, uh, I think it's not a very advanced process. So the first step, it's about uh, collecting and labeling a, a data, right, for training. So here we just use, um, um, let's say, uh, the locator for underground mines, which I shown you before, and the mobile app. We have a mobile app which just connects uh, using Bluetooth to the device and uh, configures the kind of motion which we are training now. It can be fault detection, it can be walking, running, sitting, whatever. So you just press and select the type of motion which you're labeling. Uh, then you collect some data. It can be data collected for several minutes. And the device, since it has Wi-Fi on board, right? It sends uh, all the collected raw data, the training data uh, through MQTT protocol to the broker, which is a server, right? And then we have a Python script a simple a custom Python script, which subscribes uh, to the topics and saves uh, the data from the broker to some CSV files. 
uh, what kind of data I, I'll show later. And then we take those CSV files with XYZ uh, data from Accelerometer. We upload those files to the Edge Impulse portal, which has a very nice uh, and intuitive interface to build and to train uh, ML models, right? And to deploy them later to uh, tiny ML devices. Plus, it can also generate uh, C++ libraries uh, specifically for our kind of chipset, which is Nordic uh, NRF. And then we just compile uh, statically those libraries into our firmware and that's it and do the upgrade uh, wirelessly over the air using Bluetooth. That's how the process looks like. Now some more details because I think, and I'm sure not all uh, things are clear here. Let me uh, provide some more details about the process. So the first step is about data labeling. For this example, we took uh, the helmet, uh, the minus helmet with the cap lamp. Uh, this is the smart lamp, which I mentioned before. It has that uh, BLE plus Wi-Fi locator for our TLS inside. So we, we connected, uh, one second. Mm. So uh, we, we connected uh, to this uh, device using a mobile app and simply set the parameter uh, for the label. It can begin running, falling, walking, whatever, and collected some data. And then this data is been sent from the device through MQTT. You can see some examples here, just draw XYZ uh, data from accelerometer. And all this data has been labeled for this example as fall detection, fall. So here we have two classes of motions, fall and idle, right? Which we get as a result of collecting data from the device. Uh, then we open Edge Impulse, a web portal. Again, very nice uh, software. I highly recommend this, uh, you know, for uh, tiny ML uh, deployment purposes. Then we build the so-called pipeline in the edge impulse. The first step is about the time series data, which comes from CSV files. We select different parameters here, like window size. Again, uh, the whole data is several minutes, but we need to define the window size. Based on our experience, the right window size is around two seconds, two or three seconds, which uh, is suitable to identify typical motions such as running, walking, falling, and so on. Uh, the second step, step is about spectral analysis. It's about converting time domain data to the frequency domain using, you know, uh, FFT uh, transformations and so on. Uh, after the second step, uh, we get some features which are automatically generated for, for the learning phase based on neural networks. So from spectral analysis block, we go to neural network block based on Keras. And then that this is where all the magic about uh, model training happens. And then we have uh, the model, which can be tested and validated directly here in Edge Impulse. You can see this sample screenshot, um, some classes, how they are separated right on the plane, very clear separation between fall detection and idle mode for the motion. Uh, the accuracy is 98.9%, very good for this example. Uh, yeah, and, and this is it. It's, 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 it's a very uh, simple process. The next step is about selecting our hardware chipset, which is again Nordic NRF52. We generate C library, which is just about matrices, right? Some variables with matrices. And then we compile that C library into our firmware. And we are done. Uh, in the end, you can see as a result, the device uh, sends um, RTLS data to our web portal and the data is visualized. So in addition to RTLS data, like a dot on the map, we also uh, display uh, the motion type here. So here it is uh, walking, or it can be falling or idle. So this is how it works. So nothing complicated, but I think now we have a very standard and clear process and approach to train and to launch models for motion recognition. So any questions at this stage? Uh, yes, Oleg, there are quite a few questions actually. Um, uh, so the first question is, um, 
how do you monitor for device failures and how do you manage failed devices to keep the system uh, operating? And uh, I think that uh, the device, uh, the, the question associated with that, do you have to comply with regu regulatory standards for your devices like OSHA in the US, for example? Yes, it's a very good question. So uh, to answer the first question about device uh, status monitoring. Uh, so on this specific screenshot, you can see some icons. Those are BLE beacons installed the mine, inside the mine. You can see some beacons are um, displayed as red some beacons as green. So the green beacons are the ones which um, send any signals recently, right? And red beacons here, maybe that's because uh, people did not walk near, near them, right? Or maybe they are just uh, discharged or something. So we have a built-in feature uh, inside our web portal to do device management, right? Like battery life monitoring, on-off monitoring, uh, malfunctions and so on. That's to answer the first question. And the second question about the regulations. Yes, we, as I mentioned, uh, in addition to basic uh, FCC and C certifications, we also have industry specific ATEX certifications. It is required for uh, coal mines, right? So all equipment which is installed inside coal mines must be ATEX certified and each country and each region has its own kind of standards. Uh, but uh, for some other locations like iron ore mines or our project in Bulgaria, which was about uh, copper gold mine, it didn't have such kind of regulations because uh, there is no need for ATEX there. So to answer the question, it varies, right? It depends what kind of mine you have, what kind of factory. Again, not all factories require such certifications like we have a new uh, project for a steel factory in Ukraine where we do personnel tracking tracking people. Uh, so there we don't need any ATEC certification, just a C, right? Standard C certification and, and that's it. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is, uh, I think it's also addressed in the presentation, how do you deploy new software versions on all the devices? So uh, I think it was on one of the slides. Uh, yes, if possible, let me, uh, yes, Oleg, I'm trying to, Enable full screen mode, but somehow uh, it doesn't work. One second, please. Okay, yes. Now I'm, yeah, I'm back. So, sorry about this. I'm trying to go get the right slide. So, uh, regarding uh, the firmware upgrades, one second. Yes, uh, so uh, all our devices, they're upgradable over there. So uh, devices like BLE beacons or TLS tags, they support a BLE upgrade. You just take a mobile app, right? And uh, select the device and do the upgrade. If we're talking about larger devices, such as our TLS anchors, they have Wi-Fi on board. And then we use uh, TFTP or other typical protocols such as BootP for remote uh, firmware upgrade. I see, I think, uh, thank you very much. Uh, one more question, then uh, probably we'll continue with the presentation. Uh, so do the devices store data locally and then upload it to the local edge server for analysis when the connection is made? Uh, that is a very good question because uh, for industrial projects, I, I think 90% of our customers, they install all their servers locally. They don't have any cloud servers at all, right? They have just their local networks. So they have the LAN with the devices and they have the edge server, nothing else. It's about security. It's about response time. It's about the IT policies that they don't want to keep anything in the cloud. So to answer the question, we just have typically the devices and the edge server where both uh, the web portal and the, the RTLS server is present. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Oleg. Uh, I think that you have uh, roughly five, seven minutes for the presentation and there are still five more open questions after that and then I'll have the closing part, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Oleg. And sorry about that small mess with the slides, but yeah, now I understand how to switch uh, the full screen mode. But uh, overall, I think, I think we are done here. So I explained the end-to-end -end deployment process, the result, what we get in the end, right, from the on-device ML. Right now, we're also implementing, and it's almost done, the collision avoidance, you know, not just to show 
some data because that's not all the beauty of on-device ML, right? You can also collect some data without any kind of on-device processing. You can just send the raw data to, to the cloud, to the server. But for such systems as collision avoidance, you have no other options just to process everything locally because you cannot do any kind of communications with the server because the latency and the time limitations are really, really important, right? You cannot, uh, you cannot just spend, let's say, uh, 100 more milliseconds when the vehicle, let's say, inside the mine is, uh, is, uh, is almost hitting a person right in front. You must track within, within several milliseconds, right, directly, locally on the device. And as you understand, without on-device ML and without local processing, without any service, right, it's not possible. So uh, this is it uh, about the demonstration. Uh, I tried not to make it very complicated. If you have any additional questions, uh, then uh, you can ask them now. Plus you can also visit our website, which is lintegra.com. And also I would be personally glad to answer any kind of equations if you will drop us an email at this um, address. Uh, thank you very much, Oleg. Uh, I, I must say that that was an excellent presentation. And for example, one of the comments in the chat from Mark Donaldson is, is that this is the masterclass on TinyML solution implementation. Really enjoying the presentation. Mm -hmm. I think that thanks thank uh, much lot for these kind words. And uh, we are grateful to for all participants. And there are quite a few questions remaining. So there are six more questions to address. So let's try to answer them as quickly as uh, possible. So first question from uh, Mr. Carlos. Uh, what product do you use for your MQTT broker? Uh, this is a very good question. So we we uh, reviewed several options for MQTT. Uh, one of them was about Mosquito, an open source broker. Uh, but um, many of our projects, they have the so-called QS tool level. Uh, it's about uh, guarantee for delivering messages at least once, right? So if you're familiar about MQTT, then you understand. If not, it can be easily uh, discovered. But only Verne MQ uh, broker had this had that feature in place. So we had to select Verne MQ, but still we are very happy. It's very stable, feature-rich broker. So we deployed it, I think, at least on 10 different projects. So once again, it is called Verne MQ. So nice, nice option okay. uh, for the broker. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, next question are a little bit more detailed regarding the implementation. So how much da data you had to collect for the training uh, production ML model? Was it like hundreds of thousands or more samples? Uh, so for the case of uh, people activities, it is rather about uh, the amount of samples which one person collects. It's about how many people were collecting the training data. Because especially for the case of underground mines, different people carry their helmets in different ways, right? Some people are not even fixing uh, the, the headlight on the helmet. They, they might just hang uh, the lamp, you know, somewhere on the neck. And we must also consider such kind of scenarios. Plus, you know, some people might rotate uh, the helmet a bit and it all impacts the accuracy of recognition. So to answer your question, it's not about the breadth, right? And collecting, you know, one million of samples. It's about giving the tools to not just one person, but several people, and to consider all typical ways how people can carry the device. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Oleg. Uh, by the way, right now, uh, all participants, you see the poll uh, where you can feel the feedback about, about the session. So please uh, fill uh, this uh, poll, which appeared via Zoom to you. And meanwhile, we continue to ask uh, the questions. Uh, so one more question from Alexander Zubin. So what uh, what is the size of data vector for the FFT conversion? Was it 128 or 256 or 512 samples FFT? So what was the size? Oh, let me get back to that slide because maybe I can't recall it. Uh... Now from, uh, so one second, the vector for the FFT, oh, the frequency, it was, uh, so, so since we are dealing with low power 
uh, devices, right? And we cannot afford luxury of, you know, 50 Hertz or 100 Hertz or more for accelerometer. We have two modes. We have the default mode, which is 12.5 Hertz, right? For accelerometer. And we have 25 Hertz, a bit more advanced. And as, as, as we see now on practice, this is enough. Yes, ideally, the more frequently you collect the data, right, like 100 hertz, 200, it's better, like the accuracy is better. But you, you must also consider the battery life and find the right balance between the accuracy, right, and the battery life. So to summarize, based on our experience, using 12.5 or 25 hertz for accelerometer data is enough for typical motion recognition purposes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Oleg. Please also give me the control. And the next question is, uh, uh, what is the typical model size for this application? How much memory is uh, t t typically required? So it's a very good question, actually. Uh, I think we have some numbers here, even. In terms of RAM memory, I mean, it's uh, several kilobytes. In terms of flash, uh, yes, so we have some numbers. Peak RAM usage is almost two kilobytes and flash usage is 12, 20 kilobytes. Pretty suitable, you know, for, for uh, mid-level MCU right here. I see. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next question from uh, Mark. Uh, Mark Donaldson, uh, your devices deal with human assets and human safety for RTLS. Uh, so do you plan to incorporate 5G uh, in your future releases? Actually, we already have one ongoing project about 5G based on Quetel uh, modules, 5G Quetel. Uh, I cannot disclose that much of details because of NDA, but yes, 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 we have some plans to use 5G, not for uh, indoor positioning because uh, ultra wideband RTLS has a better accuracy than 5G. Uh, ultra wideband has 20 centimeter accuracy and 5G has several meters, maybe one meter, but not better. So for data transfer purposes, low latency data transfer, yes, 5G is good. For RTLS itself, 5G is not uh, the best option for now. Okay. Thanks, Oleg. And uh, the last question for today, and please give control over the presentation in uh, in, in Zoom. Uh, so the, the last question is for collision avoidance, uh, all moving vehicles should have beacon mounted and all people in the tunnel should have wearable beacons, right? So I assume that there are some other parts where you install the beacons besides the moving parts and people. Are there any others? Uh, so the question is, uh, in which places uh, inside buildings or underground we install uh, beacons, right? Right, right. So, well, it, it depends on the algorithm. Sorry, maybe I should go back um, to the slide about the RTLS algorithm here. One second, yeah. So for the case of this algorithm, which is called reverse BLE RTLS, we just need to install beacons along the tunnels or inside rooms that we track people. Uh, for the classic RTLS algorithm or the so-called forward RTLS, you know, the people are carrying beacons or bracelets and the RTLS anchors or locators. And by saying locators, I mean, sorry again, th these devices, right? Which do tracking. Uh, they installed uh, on ceiling. So just, you know, to summarize, there is a, classic RTLS and reverse RTLS. For the case of reverse RTLS, which are using inside mines, the beacons are mounted, they're fixed inside the mine. And for the case of classic RTLS, people are carrying uh, beacons or tags inside pockets or as bracelets. Okay, thank you. And still we have more and more questions coming. So the last two questions for today. So how, uh, uh, how do you measure success for deployment of this uh, system? How do we measure success? Well, it is about being compliant with customer requirements, right? Normally it is about location accuracy. It's about recognition accuracy. Uh, it is about non-functional parameters for devices such as uh, battery life, because to be honest, sometimes uh, it, it is a challenge to keep two years for beacons because of different characteristics, like it might be extra water inside the mine, the temperature might drop, 
And as you know, maybe as you know, battery life, it depends on the temperature. Uh, the lower the temperature, uh, the less you will get in the end for the battery life. So to summarize, it's about functional requirements like location accuracy, recognition accuracy, and also non-functional ones such as uh, battery life, stability, um, and so on. Okay. Um, and uh, the one more question is, uh, how do you use the supplier to build your devices or do you acquire parts and build them yourself? So it's about the manufacturing of uh, your solution itself. So uh, the PCBs, they are designed by us and the firmware for devices, it is also developed by us. Uh, we only outsource mass manufacturing. We have one very good partner in China, in Shenzhen, right? We send our PCB files and they do mass production for us. Okay. Uh... Oleg, uh, once again, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was a very interesting and very useful meetup. And I hope that people who were there live and who will watch the video on the YouTube and uh, watch the, the PDF file, they'll be definitely interested and they will be in touch with you. Uh, and once again, let's go back uh, to uh, the tiny ML strategic partners because uh, with their help, the community grows, expands, and uh, uh, with their help, we are able to make such a great meetups. So I would like to mention each strategic partner now. Um, so ARM, the Software and Hardware Foundation for TinyML. Uh, DeepLight, we use AI to make AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Uh, TinyML for all developers. EMSA Visual Sense. The I in IoT. Uh, green wave technologies enabling the, the next generation of sensor and, and uh, hearable products to process rich data with energy efficiency. Uh, Gruit Incorporated, software development services for TNML solutions. Our partner, by the way. Uh, HOTG, distributed infrastructure for tiny ML applications. Latent AI, adaptive AI for the intelligent edge. Maxim Integrated, now the part of analog devices. So Maxim Integrated, we're enabling edge intelligence. Quixo Auto ML, automated machine learning platform that builds tiny ML solutions for the edge using sensor data. Qualcomm AI research, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous. And special uh, thanks to one of the chiefs of the TinyML community, Eugenie Gusev, who uh, actually helped to establish TinyML community in our beautiful country, Ukraine. Reality AI, add advanced sensing to your product with Edge AI and TinyML. Broad and scalable edge computing portfolio, microcontrollers and microprocessors from the ST, from the Renaissance, sorry. Seed Studio, the IoT hardware enabler. SenseML, build smart IoT sensor devices from data. Synsense, Build sensing and inference hardware for ultra low power embedded mobile and edge devices. Sintiant, uh, deep learning solutions for tiny ML and HAI. And I'd like to remind to everyone that next tiny ML talks will be in the next year on January 4th from uh, Cedric Nukteran, a software engineer from, from Plumber Rye. Uh, he will be demoing the world's fastest inference engine for ARM Cortex-M at 8 a.m. Pacific time as usual. And if you are interested, please contact talks at tinyml.org. Uh, 
once again, uh, thank you very much for the participation. I wish to everyone a very happy new year, a very happy holidays. And thanks a lot uh, to the whole tiny ML uh, community. Uh, have a great day or the good evening, depending on where you are.